Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. The subject for this video was suggested to me by somebody named Tommy on Instagram. Apparently this case is pretty famous in Finland, but it's not that well known in the rest of the world. So thanks a lot for the suggestion Tommy, I probably wouldn't have heard about this otherwise. I'll also apologise in advance for my terrible pronunciation of all the Finnish names in this video. Penti and Hilke Saarinen had married in 1947 and settled into a house in the village of Krotilla in Finland. The house was Hilke's childhood home which she'd inherited from her grandparents. It was a large wooden farm building surrounded by woodland. Together they had five children and according to some reports home life was pretty normal to begin with. And then something changed and Penti Saarinen started to drink more and more and his behaviour became increasingly violent towards his family. Most of this abuse was directed towards his wife. Neighbours reported seeing Hilke covered in bruises on multiple occasions, a result of the brutal beatings that Penty dished out. But whenever they tried to intervene, they were simply told to mind their own business. Other abuses were less visible. Verbal abuse, for example, became a constant feature in their marriage. Penty would scream at Hilke, telling her that she was an unfit mother and wife, unable to keep the house clean, cook adequate meals or look after the children. He also threatened to kill her on multiple occasions. He told her that he could murder her in such a way that he'd never be able to find the body or trace it back to him. One time he even grabbed an axe and chased her around the house with it, swinging it so hard that he took a chunk out of the kitchen table. As time went on, Penty's alcohol fueled sadism escalated and the abuses became more and more twisted. Hilke told neighbours that her husband had forced her to swallow large quantities of table salt as a punishment for some minor mistake. Another time he dragged her by the hair across the room, then forced her head into a bucket filled with excrement and food waste. Penty Saarinen worked as a mason, but his constant drinking meant that most of the household's meagre income was spent on alcohol. As a result, they often didn't have enough money for food, clothes or fuel to heat the home. In 1958, the authorities stepped in and took the children, malnourished and dressed in rags, away from the Saarinen home and placed them in foster care. And so, the battered housewife and the alcoholic husband were left together in that big house alone. Without anybody else to witness the abuses, it seems that things got even worse. Two years after the children had been taken away, on December the 23rd, 1960, Hilke was seen going into the woods with an axe and then bringing back a Christmas tree. She stopped and talked to a neighbour about her Christmas preparations. Hilke had sent a letter to her eldest son Seppo, who was 13 at the time. She'd invited Seppo to the house to spend the holidays with them and he was scheduled to arrive on December the 26th. Hilke and her neighbour chatted for a while longer. They exchanged soup recipes and then talked about what gifts they were buying for their husbands and then they parted ways. This was the last time that anyone would see Hilke alive. On Christmas Day, Seppo arrived at the family home. He was one day earlier than expected. He wanted to surprise his parents with his early visits and he brought a friend with him along to the house. He found the front door unlocked and when he entered he found his father frantically cleaning in the back room. In this room there was a large masonry oven and Seppo noticed that all the objects that were usually on top of the oven were now on the floor. His father told him that he'd taken the objects off to clean them and then he hurried the two boys out of the room locking the door behind him. This all seemed very odd to Seppo. His father didn't usually tidy up and they never locked the door to that room. And where was his mother? When he asked about his mother's absence, his father said that she'd disappeared the previous day whilst he was carrying firewood to the sauna. He didn't seem bothered by her disappearance and when Seppo tried to question him further, he appeared flustered and quickly changed the subject. The whole time that Seppo was visiting, Penty Saarinen acted really strangely. 
He was unusually tense and paranoid. Any time the boys went outside, the father would be watching them nervously from a window. Penty, Seppo and Seppo's friend spent their Christmas in the kitchen of the house. All other rooms in the house were locked. The father claimed that he could only afford to heat one room of the house and he even moved a bed into the kitchen so that they could all sleep there. The following day, Seppo and his friend explored the grounds of the house a bit more. They went into the sauna and found that there was no fuel in there, even though Penty had said that Hilke had disappeared whilst he was carrying wood into the sauna on Christmas Eve. They also noticed that a large pile of sand that used to be outside next to the cow shed was missing. It all seemed a bit weird, a bit suspicious, but they didn't mention it to Penty. They just tried to enjoy their Christmas. Soon afterwards, Seppo's friend went home earlier than expected. He was probably a bit freaked out by the father's strange behaviour. Seppo stayed on till the 1st of January and then he went back to his foster home. About a week later, Hilke's neighbours reported her disappearance to the police. Police launched a search for the missing woman and when they found no trace of her, they began to suspect that Penty Saarinen had murdered her. Neighbours reported that all the windows of the Saarinen house had been left open for several days after Hilke had vanished, strange for the dead of winter. They'd also spotted Penty cleaning all the floors of the house and burning a mattress in the garden. He was brought in for questioning but he denied all knowledge of where she was. The house was also thoroughly searched, multiple excavations were carried out on the grounds of the property but they found no clues as to Hilke's whereabouts. Over the following five years, there was an extensive manhunt for the missing woman and Penty Saarinen was brought in for questioning multiple times, but they never found anything else to go on. She had simply vanished into thin air. The eldest son, Seppo, did his own bit of detective work because he too suspected his father. In the years after his mother's disappearance, he visited the house many times. Whenever he was left alone in the property, he would search the house from top to bottom for any clues about his mother's whereabouts. During one visit in 1966, he found something unusual in that back room. Now, I've got to explain a little bit about how the house was laid out. There was a small kitchen with a big masonry oven in one corner, as can be seen in this photo. What you can't see is that the oven actually extends through that back wall into a larger room behind it. This was the same back room that Seppo was forbidden from entering on that Christmas visit in 1960. When he examined the wall of the oven in this back room, he noticed that some of the bricks near the top seemed to have been removed then replaced. He also saw that one of the oven hatches had been bricked up. He sent a letter to the local police telling them of his findings. He informed them that they should look inside the oven because it must hold the secret to his mother's disappearance. Penty was once again brought in for questioning but it seems they just didn't have enough evidence to go in and start demolishing parts of his house. The case went cold. Then, six years later, 1972, some new detectives were assigned to look at some older, unsolved cases. They took a renewed interest in the disappearance of Hilke Saarinen, and when they read Seppo's letter from 1966, they decided that they had to bring him in to aid them in their case. Seppo was allowed to read transcripts of his father's interrogations, and he spotted some inconsistencies in the story. His father had told him that his mother had vanished on Christmas Eve whilst he was carrying firewood to the sauna. Penty Saarinen, when questioned by the police, had said that Hilke had disappeared sometime in the early hours of the morning, that he'd gone to bed with her asleep next to him and then when he woke up the next morning, she was gone. These inconsistencies were enough to raise their suspicions about Penty and the police were finally able to authorise the dismantling of the oven. On the 27th of November 1972, Penty Saarinen was taken to the local police station whilst officers entered his house and began dismantling the back chamber of the oven. Inside, they found that the oven was filled with sand, and as they dug into the sand, they found the body of a woman. The 
The sealed atmosphere and the sand inside the oven had preserved the corpse quite well, and the mummified remains of Hilke Saarinen were easily identified. Finally, twelve years later, the mystery of her vanishing was solved. An autopsy failed to identify how Hilke had died. There were no broken bones or signs of any stabbing or strangulation, nor did they find any evidence of poisoning. All that could be determined for sure was that at some point after she disappeared in 1960, somebody had removed a layer of bricks from the top of the oven, dropped Hilke inside, and buried her with sand. It is possible, and disturbing to imagine, that she could have still been alive when she entered the oven. The logistics of forcing a live woman into that space and keeping her there long enough to bury her alive makes this scenario a bit unlikely, but it's still a possibility. It's also disturbing to think of Penty Saarinen living in the same house as his wife's corpse for 12 long years. Penty, of course, denied killing his wife or hiding the body in the oven, but the evidence seems stacked against him. Who else but he, a known abuser who had repeatedly threatened to murder his wife, could have done it? Who else could have dismantled and rebuilt the oven in his own home other than Penty Saarinen, a man who had worked for years as a mason? He made some wild claims about Romany gypsies breaking into his house just before Christmas, but this was quickly dismissed. The prosecution argued that, as Penty was a known abuser, it was likely that he'd killed her whilst he was beating her, but there was no way to prove that he'd murdered her intentionally. He was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to eight years imprisonment. However, six months into his sentence, the Court of Appeals decided that there just wasn't enough evidence to prove that Penty had killed Hilke or put her in the oven. He was released immediately and went back to live in that house, complete with its demolished oven, and he remained there until his death in 1986. Officially, the crime is listed as unsolved on the police records, despite all the evidence pointing to Penty Saarinen. After Penty had died, the oven murder house became a bit of a dark tourism spot up until the building was demolished in 2015. There's some decent pictures online from urban explorers who entered the property to take some morbid photographs. They give an eerie and sad insight into Penty Saarinen's final years. This post on the Ghost Funfair Urban Exploration blog describes how in 2012 they found that the house was still relatively untouched. It looked like only one room was actually used. It had a mattress on the floor where Penty had been sleeping. Another room was used as a garbage dump. The floors were littered with old bottles and corks. It appears that Penty spent his final years alone in the house, drinking himself to death whilst the rest of the building fell to ruin. The oven, they discovered, was still in its demolished state after he died. Penty had never repaired it, despite having the skills to easily do so. For 13 years, he just lived there, with that demolished oven a constant reminder of his dead wife. So thanks once again to Tommy for suggesting this case, and for helping me out a lot with all the translations and extra info. A lot of the sources I had to run through Google Translate as I was researching it and having a native speaker to help me out was pretty invaluable so thanks a lot Tommy. I thought it was pretty interesting how you could have an unsolved murder case where we almost definitely know who actually did it. So I'm glad to be able to bring this famous Finnish case to a few more people. Big thanks also to the channel supporters. Thank you very much to all of you, I couldn't make these videos without you. Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and if you like this video then check out my other contents. Thank you for watching, until next time, goodbye.